And just before I start the talk, I want to say that, you know, I think my road to and away from navigation very well mirrors what was said about the learning curve um, and using it consistently because, you know, I learned everything about navigation that I know from Roger when I was a resident with him. And we navigated many, many cases, pretty much everything. And then I did a fellowship in a place that didn't navigate and I came back. Uh, to a memorial where, you know, there wasn't a really strong tradition of navigation for tumors in general. And, you know, I was trying to figure things out for myself in terms of freehand pedicle uh, placement, um, using fluoroscopy and what are the right cases for navigation. And, you know, I was using navigation every once in a while and then navigation ended up in the corner of the room very quickly because it took a while. Uh, we had some misplaced screws because we weren't doing it all the time. And I was going to call Roger and tell him that navigation doesn't work. And then I, the more minimally invasive things I started doing, the more percutaneous screws, um, you know, I try to decrease the number of x-rays that we're taking. It became really important for me to navigate. And now we navigate many, many cases. And uh, I think probably moving toward that concept of uh, total navigation that Roger was talking about um, in case of spinal tumor surgery. Uh, so these are my disclosures. Um, first couple of slides just about, you know, tumor therapy uh, in general in the spine, uh, goals of therapy. It's uh, always local control. We want to keep the tumor from coming back, uh, preserve, restore neurologic function and stability of the spine. Uh, that usually provides pain control. And metastatic tumors are really the bread and butter of um, spinal tumor surgery. Uh, it's usually palliation, meaning we're not curing them of cancer. We're just taking care of a local problem in the spine. And then for primary tumors, sometimes we can cure them uh, if we can do optimal operation and remove the tumor altogether. And the three pillars of uh, cancer therapy in general are systemic therapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. And I think that navigation uh, will have a role in all three of these. It certainly does now in radiation therapy and surgery. And I think it's just a matter of time until we talk about targeted drug delivery for certain tumors as well. But I will spend some time talking about uh, the role in radiation and a fair amount of time talking about the role of navigation in surgery itself. Um, so what are the places, and you know, this is the outline of the talk really. So we'll talk about the extent of tumor excision. For some tumors, it matters more than others. For primary tumors, I think we have plenty of data to show that the way you take out the tumor and how much of the tumor you take out and optimizing that operation really matters in terms of risk of tumor recurrence, uh, certainly for primary tumors. For metastatic tumors, I think it matters less now because radiation has gotten so much better. Um, and we do have, need to decompress the spinal cord. We need to stabilize the spine. But tumor, uh, uh, the extent of tumor resection doesn't matter as much. Uh, then stabilization is certainly a very important part of uh, spinal tumor surgery, whether you do it with cement, instrumentation. And now we have a lot of focal therapy options as well. Uh, ablation, uh, laser therapy, brachytherapy for radiation. And uh, I think endoscopic navigation is going to be uh, playing a more prominent role in uh, the way we take out spinal tumors as well. So we'll start with the primary tumors, and we'll go through different case examples that I think illustrate the application of uh, navigation for these patients. So 22-year-old uh, kid, uh, he's in college, um, has been having back pain, finally gets a chest x-ray and has this uh, paraspinal tumor that um, has some spinal invasion. This turns out to be chondrosarcoma. So for chondrosarcoma, you know, I think the best thing we can do is do the best operation that we can because uh, we don't really have very good uh, radiation therapy right now or systemic therapy. And we know that for primary tumors, you know, we still care about the margins. Ideally, we'd like to get a wide margin or a marginal margin. And where you make those cuts really matters. And this was already mentioned by uh, uh, Charles in his talk. So, you know, for a tumor like that, I think uh, sagittal resection or vertebrectomy would both uh, work. But if you're going to be doing a sagittal resection, leaving some of the bone behind, you really need to know where to make the osteotomies. And we also know that the extent of tumor resection and having that margin matters. You know, these are the data from the AO uh, spine tumor for, uh, forum showing that if you're able to get a margin, the risk of recurrence is much lower. So uh, how do we optimize that in the operating room? We put in the instrumentation to stabilize the spine. That can certainly be navigated. Now we've talked about that a lot. And then we can use a navigated osteotome or a navigated drill uh, or any type of navigation to really tell you at what angle to make the osteotomy through the vertebral bodies in order to make sure that you have a certain margin of uh, bone around the tumor. And that re reduces the risk of recurrence because hopefully you're counting for some of the microscopic spread. So these are the places where it was useful for the resection of this primary tumor. Metastatic tumors, I think uh, radiation has gotten so good that we care less about the extent of resection now. Um, so, you know, here's a case of um, sort of bread and butter, I think, metastatic patient, 64-year-old woman, cervical squamous cell carcinoma. Um, she has some interscapular pain and is found to have a T1 metastasis. 
And so for patients with epidural uh, spinal cord compression due to solid tumor malignancies, the recommendation is to decompress them and stabilize them. Um, and now I think we move toward this hybrid therapy where we use surgery that's adapted to the radiation and radiation adapted to uh, the surgery. Um, so we know that radiation is going to take care of tumor control. We can do that very effectively with radiosurgery. So the goals of surgery have really changed for us, or certainly in my practice they have. All we need to do is decompress the spinal cord. And once we know that we've decompressed the spinal cord, we don't need to keep going in terms of tumor resection. Um, we can take care of the uh, residual tumor with radiosurgery. So we adapted the surgery. We're adapting the radiosurgery postoperatively. Uh, and this is exactly what this patient uh, underwent. She underwent the posterior approach operation, laminectomy, facetectomy. Uh, we were able to reach around the spinal cord, remove the epidural tumor, uh, you can see in the middle in the CT myelogram that we use for radiation planning that the CSF space around the spinal cord is fully reconstituted. And now we can actually effectively treat this patient with radiosurgery with low risk of tumor recurrence. And we know that this works. Uh, if we are able to deliver a high enough dose of radiation postoperatively, the risk of recurrence at one year is anywhere between, uh, less than 5%. Uh, so tumor control is very good. But we also know that the extent matters and the extent of decompression matters. And that's a really important place where I think navigation can play a role. So if we're able to get an adequate decompression of the spinal cord and that separation, uh, we have very good tumor control. If we can't and we leave residual tumor behind that's abutting the spinal cord, and we didn't realize that at the time of surgery, then the tumor control with radiosurgery isn't going to be as good. So, you know, these are the basic steps of this operation. I don't think it's anything new, but, you know, at every single step of this operation, we can use navigation to do this. So the first step is placing spinal instrumentation. We can navigate. We can use robotic screw placement for that. The second step is the decompression. We usually use a drill. They have navigated drills now that make it really easy to know exactly where you are in a decompression, how far of the pedicle, uh, how much of the pedicle you removed how much of the laminectomy is done, making sure that you have adequate decompression uh, in the back and the front, laterally, and then we remove the tumor circumferentially uh, in a piecemeal fashion. And the key here is getting around the posterior longitudinal ligament to make sure that that epidural space is decompressed. So how do you know that? Um, you know, a lot of the time you can palpate, you can be pretty sure of that, but sometimes we aren't. And uh, this is where I think uh, CT navigation can be very helpful, where we can place a probe in that epidural space, make sure that we're really flush with the vertebral body or getting inside the vertebral body. And really ultrasound, I think, you know, sort of poor man's way of navigating, but I think it works really well. Um, you know, here's an example uh, where the tumor on the, on the left side is pushed back, uh, pushing back the spinal cord. You can see that on ultrasound very clearly. And then as you do the decompression, you can recheck again uh, how much of the decompression is done, whether there's CSF around the spinal cord ventrally and posteriorly. And if you have little nubbins of tumor, it's very easy to put a dissector there to really confirm where that is. So I think uh, ultrasound navigation is also very helpful. Uh, stabilization, the other big piece, and uh, as radiation gets better, I think we do less and less decompression and more and more stabilization for a lot of these patients. Um, and cement and instrumentation work very well. So uh, here's another example, 61-year-old patient with multiple myeloma. He has uh, lower back pain, gets worse with movement. Uh, he has an L3 burst fracture that's extending into the pedicle. Uh, so he needs to be stabilized. Uh, if we try to make these decisions, we can use the SINS uh, uh, score to say that you know, this patient is clearly unstable uh, because of uh, uh, his score is high enough to really merit an intervention. And this is my workhorse now for stabilizing these patients. Uh, percutaneous instrumentation with cement reinforcement, and then we also kyphoplasty the level that's fractured. The reason why we do use a lot of cement for these patients, you know, so our mantra for uh, metastatic patients has always been for open surgery, two above, two below, because uh, the bone is fairly poor quality. They have some adjacent level tumors sometimes or some bony infiltration. And so we like to share that load. But now uh, with cement, you know, we've been very comfortable with this technique and it works really, really well. Um, and where you put the screws sometimes matters here. You know, the precision of actual trajectories because sometimes you have a little bit of tumor somewhere and you'd like to avoid it when you put in the screw. Same goes for where you place the cement and the kyphoplasty level. Sometimes you'd like to reinforce the intact portion of the bone. Sometimes you'd like actually to fill the cavity itself. So, you know, being able to place the uh, cannulas precisely uh, helps a lot with these. And then finally, a few uh, slides about focal therapy. Uh, we're getting better and better with percutaneous uh, techniques for tumor control. 
um, and they will probably play a much larger role as we move forward because these are getting better. So um, this is a compression fracture, a 54-year-old patient with Lamy sarcoma. Our interventional radiologists can very easily kyphoplasty this patient, and that's what they get, but now they also get an ablation to go along with it. Uh, and the reason for ablation, you know, we still rely on radiation for tumor control. I don't think we have very good data yet, at least, to say that ablation provides good tumor control, but the pain levels uh, are much lower for these patients. So patients who get a kyphoplasty, you know, they can hurt for a few hours, for a few days. Um, our interventional radiologist actually swears now that every time he ablates a vertebral body before putting in the cement, the patients get right off the table and say, I feel great, thank you. But you want to do it at the right place, so you want to be able to drive those cannulas to the place where you'd like to ablate. Um, this is a slide about laser interstitial thermotherapy. This is something that Claudio Tatsui is doing in uh, MD Anderson. So this is another form of ablation where uh, you have to be able to place the probe very precisely. Mostly the purpose of this is to really provide an epidural decompression for these patients. Uh, and that's what's different about this therapy compared to the other ablation techniques. And so rather than doing a decompression using you know, a drill or uh, instruments to remove the bone, you can place a, a, a laser probe into the tumor uh, and hopefully shrink the tumor enough to provide that same separation that I was talking about for the open cases. And then these patients go on for radiosurgery and have good pain relief. But obviously being able to place these cannulas precisely into the tumor and away from uh, the spinal cord is really important. And then finally, some uh, radiation applications. This is something that we've collaborated on with our uh, radiation oncologists. So radiation is very good at providing uh, tumor control, but you know, there are still certain cases where we've radiated these patients and the tumors keep coming back no matter how much we, uh, of the tumor we remove or how much we irradiate it. And once you max out the external uh, beam radiation, uh, you still have the capability to provide brachytherapy seeds that can be placed inside the tumor, can be placed inside the vertebral body, and then radiate this way as well, which provides some additional tumor control. So again, of course, being able to place these uh, seeds precisely exactly where you need them to go um, uh, is very important, and this is where navigation has helped us a lot. And in, in cases where you have to navigate around the hardware as well. And then finally, endoscopic navigation. This is actually a slide that uh, you know, borrowed from uh, uh, Daniel's and uh, Dr. Johnson's paper, but I think this is very cool, and I think this will play a much bigger role in uh, the way we take care of spine tumors in the future. The use of endoscopy, I think when you have long trajectories, being able to navigate uh, the placement of the endoscope and instruments is, could be very helpful, and I know that some of the endoscopy companies are working with uh, navigation companies in order to make this work. So I I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about this. I'm, working and making this part of my practice as well. So in conclusion, I think really spinal navigation has a very prominent role in taking care of spinal tumor patients. You know, we can define tumor margins for osteotomies in the mobile spine and the sacrum. Uh, we can uh, decompress using navigation or certainly evaluate the extent of decompression, stabilize ablate tumors, and uh, use it for radiation. Thank you. Thank you.